Great. Well, I'm pleased to be presenting to you the concluding session of our day, and um, I hope you've had a very productive and informative uh, few sessions here at the Guild Hall. Um, I'd like to thank, obviously, the City of London and our sponsors uh, uh, for, for helping put this together. Uh, it's the first time UK-India Sustainable Investing Forum's been done and we expect it to be done uh, on a yearly basis. So that's uh, uh, something to look forward to. Coming to the panel on future sustainability, for scale and effectiveness, um, we've heard a lot today about uh, sustainable finance and sustainable investing in terms of pro uh, how, what it means for public and private markets. For, for global funds and for funds in India and the interrelatedness between the two, as well as the standards and practices that uh, help financial enablers of sustainable uh, goals and uh, SDG goals and ESG goals um, and, and, and the CSR uh, initiatives going on in India. Um, to, to give a little bit of color, um, I'm a quant man myself, so I do like numbers, and to give a sense of the scale of the market uh, globally, uh, one can consider 23 trillion or 26% of global assets to be ESG related. And yet in India itself, um, it's considered only about 25 billion or 8% of assets are ESG related. So clearly a very great deal of scale uh, still left to go in India to achieve sustainable goals. And um, today we're going to, you know, we've we've uh, learned a lot about how that how the challenges and opportunities uh, have to be unlocked to sort of level that playing field. Uh, I'll quickly uh, allow allow the speakers to present themselves, or rather, uh, you can check out their bios in the program. Um, but what we want to cover in this session is a combination of the regulatory and policy uh, systems and processes um, that, that will help enable uh, sustainable investing at a global scale as well as uh, in, the, in the case of India. Um, some of the technology developments around financial inclusion and using that as an example. Uh, we've got Infosys represented here who have done a great deal in terms of enabling financial inclusion and banking the unbanked. And that's a great lesson to learn from a platform perspective um, and, and copying that to large scale programs for sustainable investing. And last uh, but not least is Srini with uh, Egvesto who will cover some of the market developments um, uh, in, in India and globally. Um, let me hand over to Anastasia uh, of UNPRI. UNPRI um, have been growing year by year by close to 20 to 30% uh, in terms of signatories. So I hope you guys check them out and become a signatory yourself. Anastasia. Thanks for the plug. Um, good afternoon and thanks for having us. It was, I came in about 45 minutes ago and I did hear some people talking about uh, the UNPRI and being signatories. Um, I won't go into, sorry, this is in, in the interest of good corporate governance, that's the disclaimer, so I'll put it up for 30 seconds and you can pretend to read it, but. Um, so the PRI, the UNPRI is, uh, it's a, an association of responsible investors, the largest of its kind, uh, two UN partners, which is the Global Compact, based in New York, and the UN Environment Program Finance Initiative, based in Geneva, we're based in London. 2,700 signatories and climbing. Um, the growth has been almost unsustainable, which is, which is an interesting problem to have. But we do cover 90 trillion assets under management, which, for context, is about two-thirds of the investable market, both in public and the private side. So that means two-thirds of capital in the world is signed up to the principles. So we've got a lot of people signed up and now we have to make them do something. 
Now, my bread and butter every day is to talk about risk and sustainable risk-adjusted returns for signatories, because that's the majority of the mainstream, that's what they join the PRI for, that's what we specialize in. But there's something else that's been happening. That comes from an intrinsic, as you, as you can imagine, understanding that to, there's a social floor and an ecological ceiling to growth of companies and countries, and that if you're managing money for the long term, you have to keep that into account and manage ESG risks, which are often not on the balance sheet today. What's happening and what I'm here to talk about is something different. Now, keep it really brief. But there are, in Europe, there's been a sense that we know that there's a massive gap in financing to the transition to the low carbon economy. And capital is not moving in that direction. Climate Kick was talking about this in the previous panel. So Europe has decided regulation it's going to be. And they have put together a sustainable finance plan. Sorry, this was a quick slide we'll skip over. And what that plan is doing is 10 things, and perhaps we can circulate the slides and you can look at all the 10 things, but the key things here to watch for are establishing a sustainable taxonomy, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Taxonomy is a classification system. Those of us who might have a financial analysis background know that that's how we Economic activities is how people list on stock exchanges and etc. Creating green labels and standards. And I think the important thing here is making sure that the retail side of the markets are advised on sustainability through their IFA by law. And, and lastly, putting together some disclosure requirements on all mainstream funds, regardless of whether they are sustainable funds or not. Now, the last one is interesting because it means that you don't have to have a sustainability product to still have to talk about how do you think about climate change across your portfolio. And that portfolio could be BlackRock's 6.8 trillion. So interesting new business strategy changes happening around the world in the markets as we speak. Interestingly, so this is the EU action plan. Does it really affect the UK? Does it affect the rest of the world? We did an analysis of this and found that 88% of the 90 trillion is impacted by the EU action plan because you're either selling into Europe or in some way using European standards to sell elsewhere. So this is going to impact us all, including the UK where one expects regulation arbitrage is going to take place and we know that the city wants to be the chief broker of green finance in the world. So the taxonomy, and the reason I wanted to discuss this in, in particular is, we keep talking about sustainable capital and sustainable finance, but we each have our own definitions as, as to what that really means. And that's been really difficult as an investor because it's never really clear what somebody's fund is, what their philosophy is, how they think about transition. So what the EU did was they brought together about 160 experts across all of economic activity sectors and think about which sectors can it logically deem to be important to the transition. It classified those sectors and what environmental performance you need to have in those sectors to be a sustainable investment. That's what the taxonomy is. It includes everything from power generation to transport to cement and steel, because both of those last two will be needed for the transition. You still have to build the, the, the wind turbines of steel at the moment. And so what this does is it kind of takes all of the guesswork around what sustainability means from an economic activity perspective completely out of the picture. So from a regulatory perspective, what this is going to do is if you have a sustainability fund, a green bond, et cetera, you're going to have to say what percentage of it is compliant with the EU taxonomy. Now, this doesn't mean that the markets can't invest in you if you are 40% compliant. It just means that you have a view, you're taking that view, and it's a disclosure about how that relates to 27 of the large economies of the world, probably 28 if you take the, uh, the UK into account. 
So it's going to be a, a game changer, and um, from what I understand, a lot of the audience is thinking about sustainable projects and sustainable bonds, especially marketing it in the city and other parts of the world. This is going to be something everyone's going to think about. So I'll keep that brief and leave it there. Hello everyone, my name is Manish. Uh, today I'm representing Infosys, as you know, is a technology provider. So what I'm here to talk about is the technology enablement of sustainable finance. Um, so, uh, you know, without going into too much theory, all I'll talk about is three stories. Uh, three stories uh, that have manifested itself into something really remarkable. Uh, over over the last two to three years, and it has made a visible impact and the difference uh, in terms of how the finance uh, reaches, uh, you know, like we say, bank for the unbanked. So, to begin with, uh, 2014 was a landmark year, tight turn. Uh, Modi government uh, uh, came into center and. Uh, one of the uh, one of the big decision by the government and the vision was uh, bank for the unbanked and for that they actually went through multiple hoops including adopting aadhar uh, uh, in the in the present state and form as we see it now uh, there was uh, there was a there was a good government push uh, the vision was set uh, to uh, to get the financial inclusion done, and that too with a sense of urgency. However, there were too many hurdles, and uh, uh, and you know a lot of stakeholders in the mix. To cut the long story short, once we had on board uh, the multiple people, these multiple stakeholders, uh, including Niti Aayog, Aadhaar, uh, RBI, and uh, we and our partners, together actually creating a, a steering committee. We actually went down through the roadmap route, and one of the important bits, so there were many parallel initiatives planned, but one of the most important bit was India Post. Why India Post? Uh, for those of you who follow Bollywood uh, quite a bit, uh, if, you, uh, if you remember a movie called Swadesh, uh, it's about the main character actually flying, uh, flying to India into a very small village and then making an impact into the village. But the only way he could actually communicate out was through a very small post office. Uh, the point I'm trying to make over here is to reach the last man and the last mile, there was no other way but to actually go via the post office. So a, a call was taken to actually digitize the India Post uh, because uh, the smartphone penetration was extremely high. So leverage that and and uh, you know bring all the people within uh, within the bank uh, within the financial inclusion. So. Uh, after the initial hurdle, uh, we actually uh, took, uh, 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 you know, took a, a base technology, one for banking and one for insurance. Uh, for those interested in the platform, it was Finical and McCamish, but uh, that's too much of detail. The idea was by bringing together the power of platforms, digital and fintechs, how we could actually accelerate this journey into the matter of months. So from start to finish, and you could actually see some numbers over here. These are like mind boggling numbers by any scale and imagination across the world. 602 million, which denotes almost 70% of the population. Uh, bank accounts opened and about 40 million life insurances uh, given out. And, and these life insurance uh, the, was to secure their future, and, and we know there is a lot of agrarian crisis. Uh, we have situations of uh, you know calamities uh, 
you know, uh, driven pre uh, predominantly by the climate change and so on and so forth. How do you secure the karta of the family? And uh, some of these, uh, the life insurances, you know, if I turn it into uh, pence, it would be like 35 pence a month. That's what it costed at the end of the day. And uh, with the zero balance, unique identified, uh, you know, uh, linked to the UDI. Now, with this implementation, it gave us, a, uh, you know, a infrastructure for sustainable finance. What people did with it uh, is my second story. So, uh, so there's this uh, small case in the point, uh, Ujivan Bank. This is a small finance bank. And uh, they're typically into the micro lending, uh, small and medium scale lending. Once they saw uh, uh, the, the, the entire infrastructure that got created via the India Post, uh, reaching to the last mile, the last mile, they saw this as, a, as an opportunity to actually push through uh, the micro and the, uh, and the small and medium uh, scale funding to economically poor, of course, but more importantly, the middle missing. It's a very interesting term uh, when I was speaking to Jeevan and uh, to some of our FinTech partner, R2. Uh, middle missing, right? These are the people who could be tomorrow a middle class of India's population, but today they are missing. And uh, how can we actually, uh, right from the need to cash, accelerate that process which currently takes a, uh, used to take about uh, anything between 24 days to three months, how can we do that in the matter of hours or in a single day? And that was the whole point because if you know India, you know that this sector typically, and especially in the, uh, in the rural area, uh, looks for source of income or funding from the unorganized sector. So, uh, so by use of technology and again, uh, some of the, uh, the platforms that we have and then partnering with some of the fintechs, you know, accelerated the journey uh, in six to eight months to actually set up, set this up of, of between 2,000 to 2 lakh kind of a window to, uh, to be provided uh, to farmers, to the cottage industry, to the uh, smaller traders uh, in the non-rural non areas. So that's, uh, uh, that's my story number two about how do you leverage uh, sustainable infrastructure, uh, sustainable finance infrastructure once it is in place. My third story, and, uh, and this is uh, slightly bigger in canvas. So um, if you look at the Commonwealth, it comprises of 53 nations and some of the, and if you look at the population which the Commonwealth has, it is roughly one third of the world's population. Actually, if, if somebody has to draw a map of climate change, you would actually realize that one of the worst sufferers of climate change have been the Commonwealth nations. Let me take a case in the point. So, uh, for example, Samoa. Lovely country, small one, uh, wonderful people. I have some excellent friends from there. You know, if you actually track that timeline of this country, there is something very interesting that will strike you. Uh, the country normally operates at 64% uh, of external borrowing to their GDP. And then a tsunami happens. The next year, their uh, external borrowing to GDP shoots up to 120%. This is a real data. If you Google for it, you'll get it. And then th they have to work for another four to five years, do something extraordinary, outstanding, to actually bring it down to sustainable levels of 63 to 64%. The point is, it was becoming uh, too difficult, especially for the LIC and the MIC, which was the low income countries and the medium income countries within the Commonwealth, to actually tell to the uh, world that unless and until uh, the funding that we get is a sustainable finance or sustainable funding, it is not going to, uh, it's not going to be in a welfare for 
anyone. It will be a zero-sum game. And like Mark Carey has once famously said, uh, the climate change will be uh, one of the biggest financial devastation uh, you know mankind will see right so uh, so there was a huge need by the commonwealth to uh, uh, to basically you know conceptualize and bring out this platform uh, wherein the central bank uh, the state and the finance ministry can together look at every single external borrowing, be it of any asset class, uh, uh, including bonds, uh, you know, uh, public debt guarantees, private uh, fundings, and so on and so forth, and actually uh, you know, uh, take a view that, look, we need to have at least a bulk of it coming uh, uh, through, a, through a green bonds or through sustainable financing. And today, the technology, uh, we launched this platform on 6 June. Uh, seven countries amongst the Commonwealth are the first adopters. All the countries are in the queue to actually uh, log on to the platform. India is one, is one of the first uh, to actually latch on. Uh, RBI was extremely excited. Today, 5,000 different kind of external borrowings by RBI are, are on this platform. Uh, through Meridian and they plan to bring all the asset class uh, in the next year or so under this platform. So this gives a unique opportunity for the countries in the Commonwealth to seriously look at uh, the financing they're getting uh, for their external borrowings and to make it into a sustainable financing. With that, I rest my case. Thank you. Uh, just a quick word in terms of, uh, I think you, you heard from me before, so I don't want to repeat some of these. Um, I think the element about the whole kind of role of technology is very critical from a market development point of view. Um, a lot of you know about the GDPR, uh, which was um, you know, started in, at the EU level, uh, really become the cornerstone in the last, uh, last few years, uh, both from an SME level and also the other corporate level. Uh, there's still some fundamental differences between how an emerging market sees the equivalent of GDPR um, and also the likes of the U.S. Uh, versus, you know, what's been adopted here. Um, I'm just uh, throwing it out there on how we looked at from a different type of data and, and the assets that you potentially have and what kind of problems they have when you develop the market. Um, so typically a good use case is when you're looking at a, uh, an insurance program, um, you do have some good idea about where the assets are. There are some data owners like weather stations and the likes of uh, physical data asset owners, which are the companies. They potentially are all sitting in their silos right now. Um, when it comes to market development, whatever decision that we are making, whether it comes to insurance or investment, um, relying purely on uh, financial reports, which is a lagging indicator, uh, it's something that the market is moving away from. Um, definitely you will include it, but at the same time it's quite important to think about what real asset data that you can get. Um, and then now there's a number of initiatives that's been thrown in, especially driven by the technology group, about understanding data, looking at uh, interoperability, and, and also looking at the security aspects as well. The other, which, we, which is less spoken about, is the whole kind of infrastructure and security aspect. Critical infrastructure assets, uh, against which, you know, like energy assets and then the rest of farmland assets, it's quite impossible to get the data out of the country. Like in a place like Indonesia, for example, is, uh, there is no cloud offering that is currently sitting at the, at the Ministry of Agriculture level. So it is quite important to, to realize that, you know, as a part of market development, isn't about the financial structures and the instrument put in place, but when it comes to handling multiple of these uh, data sources and, you know, how do you integrate them into decision making, uh, what type of policies you have from an IT infrastructure point of view, from data security point of view. I just want to leave it out there with, uh, with one more slide. So this is uh, something that's happening globally. Uh, much of you actually see satellites as um, you know, something out there which actually can measure a little bit of information. 
but it's about 160 climate satellites, which is actually sitting out there uh, measuring various, uh, various elements about water, food, land, um, and the likes of uh, entities as well, the critical infrastructure like energy plants. And they do generate a lot of data. Uh, what that means is from a technology landscape point of view, every country is building an infrastructure to look at the downlinks and see, can we be uh, doing all the uh, AI uh, up in the satellite so we don't have to download all the data to the ground and assess it. And we've been part of the, some of these uh, missions like NASA, uh, European Space Agency, and JAXA to, to look from an insurance point of view. Uh, but from an investment landscape, they do become quite useful. There are other ones like Denmark, which has taken a lead on uh, monitoring emissions on the shipping and logistics sector. A uh, lot of these ships basically, you know, they contain operators and they contain a lot of this cargo and the emissions of it is not gone unnoticed. Uh, they've sent a number of missions through drones to collect a lot of data to monitor what the carbon emissions coming out of the logistics and transport sector in the sea. And similarly, there's a number of these data getting collected about the land itself. There's a specific uh, mission by NASA called uh, Carbon Monitoring System, which actually monitors the emissions at a three by three kilometer basis. Um, there's one more uh, uh, slide to wrap it up. Um, so effectively, when you look at most of these initiatives, uh, there are special initiatives such as Icebreaker One, which the cabinet office um, is um, actually uh, leading the show. And this lady out there called Gia, who's a project manager, uh, if you want to reach out, uh, by all means do. Uh, so we got insurance companies, invest in investment companies, and the likes of UNEP involved. And this whole idea is to mobilize um, the success of open banking into a, an open environmental risk standard. So we do spoke a lot about the standards. Uh, without the data sharing uh, from an environmental risk data point of view, we're still going to optimize on a local level, but this is the first initiative which is looking at a cross-border, cross-sector level where the data gets uh, shared without leaving the infrastructure, but it's just purely having the transparency and the disclosure and making sure it is secure so that the critical infrastructure data is shared among participants, which means if you've got a large counterparty transactions like green bond coming through, every counterparty could potentially be able to share in a safe, secure manner so you can mobilize capital at scale and, and um, mobilize insurance at scale. And there are a number of these initiatives that you could potentially talk about. Um, and um, I just want to leave it out with one final initiative. I think on the UK-India corridor, there's a number of these happening. The UK-India, um, to start recapping what we spoke, at the policy level, we got the UK GFI, which we are involved in, uh, Macquarie and the likes of City of London, led the show, and we have a report released today. The FCAs and the PRAs are having their own discussions, uh, which is through a lot of regulatory sandbox, and a recent mission by City of London, uh, Lloyd Mayer's mission. We sat together and spoke with the SEBI and IRDI in terms of what we should be doing together in mobilizing this. I think regulators have an important role to play. Uh, Market-wise, I think we had an extensive coverage today, both from the issuers and investment point of view. Um, and then if we can support that with all the support mechanism, the raters, the verifiers, the, uh, the rating agencies themselves, the assurance uh, from an accounting point of view, and finally, not to say the least, to deploy at scale and reach the SDG goals, the, the technology companies can have a supporting role as well. So I see the last bit actually converging into a good supporting ecosystem. And uh, bringing all of these parties together at, at the both country level, uh, which potentially we should be able to uh, mobilize and make the impact that we can. So I'll leave it with that message. Um, so it's a sort of uh, call to arms to come together and we can make it happen. Thanks, Srini. Um, I'm going to intervene with a broad question. Um, I'm uh, cognizant of time and then, and then open it up to the floor for a couple. Uh, a couple of questions from them. Um, so we touched upon um, the need to raise international finance and the standards and practices that are involved in that and the new generation of green labeling and uh, green standards coming out, especially from the EU. Uh, we talked about um, uh, something that uh, I don't think gets enough attention, which is the way the Indian government brought together a multi-stakeholder massively scaled program to achieve a sustainable goal 
of financial inclusion of 602 million people. That's pretty awe-inspiring in such a short period of time. And the lessons that came out of that in terms of the, in, uh, in, in, in terms of the infrastructure for achieving those goals. And of course, the data, legal frameworks, open standards that underlie a lot of both those topic areas. So my, my, my broad question is this, what in practical terms, uh, the audience here I believe are a mix of folks who uh, want to understand how to plug themselves um, into this new generation of green financing standards uh, and raising green finance, green bonds uh, in, in the city of London, but also how on the um, other side of the coin, how to plug themselves into the infrastructure uh, that Manish uh, and Shrini talked about um, to participate in the huge opportunity uh, that is Indian sustainable investing. So uh, maybe you, uh, Anastasia, you wanted to start with the, you know, the raising of that, um, the sort of pract practical terms, the recommendations you would make. So I think in practical terms, the thing to do is just take a look at the taxonomy. Some of it is quite intense. I think it's a 400 page report. Um, but really, there are maybe two pages that are important, which is exactly which sectors are they considering important for the transition, and what environmental standards do you have to have in those sectors to be taxonomy compliant? I mean, that's really what the game is. So whatever type of project you're developing, is it in the sectors that they're looking at? And are you doing it in a way that's taxonomy compliant? Because if it is, then you have a much better chance of being able to come here mm. and say that you're going to, you know, you're X percent taxonomy compliant and no one's expecting 100%, you know, it's, it's early days. But it makes a huge difference to be able to, you know, we were talking about people, even without the tech, taxonomy compliance sort of label, which obviously is a new one, um, you know, being hugely oversubscribed, you know, two, three times oversubscribed and people trying to get placed into, the, into these quite small deals. And so I think the taxonomy compliance is just something that's going to be law. It's not an option. You're going to have to do it if you're trying to raise finance in these markets. But if you can structure the deal ahead of time in the way that it's going to work in your favor, it could be quite useful. Manish, in terms of plugging themselves into the <laughs> opportunity? So uh, I think uh, since I said story, so let me continue with yet another story. So uh, uh, you know what this uh, financial inclusion and this sustainable finance infrastructure has given the capability uh, to the cottage industry is there, uh, there are now cottage industries who have gone innovative and they are actually crowdsourcing they are really crowdsourcing, uh, you know, based on the business plan. So something similar to what we have in uh, UK called as the funding circle. And they are actually sharing their plans online of how they are going to, the entire value chain is, uh, uh, is based on a very sustainable means, uh, you know, very organic, you know, uh, climate neutral, carbon offset, all the good things, right? And for all this cottage industry, they are actually crowdsourcing, and people are paying them. They are uh, they are getting 300 to 400 percent of what they are actually going into the market, and that has been only uh, possible because of this. I know of one particular case in Rajasthan uh, where um, uh, you know we were talking about textiles earlier, um, one of the speakers, and um, there's this. Uh, a lady who has actually collated um, a, a lot of women uh, with very meager means and they had no livelihood almost and she has actually collated all, all of them together under a single umbrella and they are producing um, uh, you know produce a cottage produce hand -in produce under their own brand and they are being crowd uh, crowd funded and some of the uh, some of the funding is actually coming from externally which is brilliant and which is only possible because of this infrastructure. So, so, so a lot of the opportunity is really down at the low level, the sort of the impact level where, where you see those high returns. 
from a from a finance perspective, 300, 400 percent is is a is a huge red mark on on market inefficiency there. So uh, plenty of capital to deploy in that area. Shrini. Yeah, I would say yeah. Uh, engaging with the retail market um, is uh, is one of those big elephants that uh, normally is coming out. Uh, you know, a common consumer uh, reacts um, looking at what's coming his way or her way. Um, whether it comes to healthcare, whether it comes to education, whether it comes to sectors, it's the first time we have the opportunity to really engage uh, rather than thinking through the sectors and the product and services that we offer to the market. The first time the CSR reports and sustainability report is um, tilted more towards what the consumer-led initiatives. Mm. That doesn't necessarily mean you know the big IPO um, companies all the way down to small micro companies. Uh, people getting engaged and the building the brand which is sustainable uh, is going to help you a lot. Um, cost of capital is one of the big constraints that a lot of these emerging market uh, companies do. However, if you're looking at sustainability or the, the grassroots level, whether it talks about villages, uh, fisheries, for example, small manufacturing companies, textile companies, keep engaging with the consumers because the moment they know uh, that you are actually doing things sustainably, they'll become your biggest uh, uh, marketing champion. I think that's, that's one big opportunity that I could think. I guess we've got time. I have a question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's wait for the mic. Got it. As, as usual, uh, being a UK India event, we've, we've uh, you know, uh, done ahead of schedule. Actually, quantum advisors question really to Anastasia. So in 2008, where the financial crisis, uh, President Obama came promising change. He actually tripled the size of TARP and he rescued the financial firms that caused the crisis. And effectively, if you look at the uh, financial markets today, the largest mutual funds are larger today than they were then. Same with the banks, they've increased market share, everything else. So we've got a global governance crisis and a global climate crisis on its way. And in 2014, when I heard about PR, I was so excited, went on the website, read the stuff, and then I read it was a self attestation And then I read that large groups have agreed to go and join and sign on, and they issue fabulous chairman's letters and CEO's letters, and I see what they're doing on the ground. They're supporting terrible stuff. And I'm kind of nervous that with the UN stamp behind PRI, that becomes law. And again, the same people that caused the first crisis are causing this crisis of governance and will flourish because they, will, they have lobbied and they will lobby that their definition of governance remains. And as you correctly said, there is no one definition. Everyone looks at governance or, or ESG in a different way. So I really feel that many of these large firms are using the PRI stamp to get away with murder in some sense. And there's nothing that PRI can do because it's self-attestation. Okay, you. so I think that um, the, the first 10 years of the principles were about awareness raising. You know, what is ESG in a, in a market perspective? What does it mean if you are looking at a, at a company that is manufacturing vaccines in whichever part of the world. You know, you're looking at health and safety, you're looking at environmental standards, you're looking at workers' rights, et cetera. What should that company be worth if they're doing it well versus if they're doing it medium versus if they're doing it badly compared to their peers? I mean, that's, and then you make a, a decision about how you want to, to value that particular firm, either as a creditor or as an owner. I think the 10 years, we did very well. So from that perspective, People understand what looking at ESG risks in debt and in equities, and now slowly in private markets, looks like. You know, there's no running away from that. That was our challenge to begin with. The next 10 years, and we're into the three-year cycle of the 10 years, it's about, is about impact, and this is small i impact, which is if you take these risks into account, one would imagine if the markets exist to allocate capital to the most efficient resources, then you would imagine that we would be heading towards a sustainable outcome from a global perspective of which the SDGs are a part. Clearly that's not happening right now. And so what is the PRI doing? Two things, one is you talked about self-attestation. What that really means is the sixth principle of the, there are six principles of the PRI, I didn't go into details because I, I know there aren't um, 
that many investors in the room, but uh, the sixth principle is that we will report on our implementation of the principles on an annual basis. What this means is every single one of the 2,700 signatories have to report to the PRI on a private basis. 45% of their report is made public. The rest is what is considered uh, competitive, competitively sensitive information, so it isn't. But we score them. So between them and us, we know what they are scored against their peers. And if you're an asset owner like a pension fund or a sovereign wealth fund or a foundation, you can ask your fund managers what they scored. And people, organizations globally are doing that. So this idea of self-attestation, is it's not as, as straightforward as that. You self-attest, yes, so, which is, means essentially you are, it's, a, it's voluntary disclosure. We are scoring you, and then your clients are asking you about your scores and why you didn't do well, or you know, more, more granular information about what you mean by X, Y, or Z. So I don't think it's as toothless as it sounds. In fact, perhaps of all UN bodies, it's the least toothless when it comes to looking at um, the private markets. Um, and so I think that we are, we are on, well on our way to, to sort of as I said to you, 90 trillion signed up, but what does that 90 trillion do? Um, and, I, and I think that we're moving forward with that. But we hear you. We think that this is a risk. I'm, I'm afraid we don't have any more time for questions, but there is uh, uh, time for refreshments so, and an opportunity to, to go and question our panel uh, some more. Um, so I just want to conclude uh, uh, that brings this day to an end. Uh, do you want to conclude or? Long enough? No? All right. No? Okay, fine. Uh, thank you uh, to the sponsors, ICICI, Edelweiss, Jiva, um, and um, Agvesto, obviously. And um, I really hope this has been a very productive day. Uh, Clearly, there's a huge opportunity here, and it's a secular megatrend, as Lord Gardia had mentioned in the morning, uh, here to stay, and clearly a lot of challenges and opportunities that, that um, are going to present itself in, in terms of India going abroad and raising uh, green financing, as well as the world coming to India and, and tackling its own special ch uh, uh, sense of um, how, how it wants to develop its own uh, SDG goals. Um, so with that said, um, thank you very much for coming. And uh, please help yourself to uh, coffee and I hope some cake as well. So thank you. Thank you.